With Dying Light 2 right around the corner, I, Suggestive Gaming, figured now would be a great time to take a look at where the story currently stands to get ready for the long-awaited sequel. Couple of notes before we start, as always I'll have to leave some stuff out in order to keep this video succinct. This includes most of the side stories and optional quests in the first game to better focus on the main story. I also won't be talking about Dying Light Bad Blood, the standalone battle royale title, since it's pretty light on story elements. Additionally, I won't be going over the Dying Light 2 audio stories over on the official YouTube channel of the game, since they're mostly standalone, but I'll leave a link in the description if you want to check those out. Another quick note is that since the DLC expansion, the following has three possible endings, and developer Techland is keeping quiet on which one is actually canon, although there's a pretty good idea of which one it is, I'll be covering all three during that section. Also, because this video will likely get demonetized thanks to a lot of talk about things that are coincidentally currently affecting the world, I'll just leave a quick reminder that I've got a Patreon where you can directly support the channel and keep these videos coming out faster while being bigger and better. Or you can become a channel member here on YouTube if that's more your style. Links for both are in the description. Obviously not required, but insanely appreciated. Alright, without further ado, this is what you need to know about Dying Light. Our story begins in the year 2014, where we find Dr. Kaleem Abbas working in a free clinic in the slums of the city of Haran, Turkey. One of his patients, a boy named Joran Badar, comes in with flu-like symptoms after claiming to have been bit by a man in the slum square. While Abbas simply writes it off as a stomach virus, the boy's feral behavior seems to point to something a bit more serious. This is proven when the boy is brought back in a few days later, but violently escapes, biting several family members in the process. As the days continue, more and more cases of unexplained violent attacks and missing persons occur in the city. But despite Abbas's protests, President Hamid refuses to postpone the global athletic games that are to be held in the city in the upcoming days, instead tasking the doctor with finding out what's causing this medical dilemma. The games are allowed to go on, but the increased population only causes the reports of murder and missing persons to skyrocket. Abbas assembles a package of some blood samples of his patients to send to a colleague named Dr. Christina Marlowe in the United States, but somehow loses the attached letter on his way to the post office, leaving him to send her only the package. He then stops at the Newtown High School where strange, chant-like noises have been heard. As he enters, however, he is attacked by a massive swarm of the yellow-eyed, mindlessly aggressive infected, who immediately kill the doctor. At the games, an event later referred to as D-Day occurs, when a horde of infected enter the games and attack the spectators and competitors. Two weeks later, Haran is placed under quarantine after the number of infected grows beyond control. An 18-year-old American athlete in the city for the games named Mel Wyatt takes refuge in a hotel inside an area referred to as Nightmare Row. When the hotel is attacked, however, she is forced to escape on her own, getting bit by an infected during her escape. Rumors of an incoming medicine airdrop from the recently formed Global Relief Effort, or GRE, give her hope to survive. Mel fights her way through infected and uninfected alike to reach the City Hall, where she believes one of the airdrops will land. There she also spots her lost brother Paul, now infected and completely turned. As she runs from the infected outside City Hall, she enters the building and takes refuge in the office of the Haran Commission of Health. Inside, she finds Dr. Abbas's items, including his letter to Dr. Christina Marlowe, which he dropped on the floor. In it, Abbas describes the rabies-like virus taking control of the city, as well as the government's inaction to prevent it and attempts to instead cover the entire thing up. He also explains that the Newtown High School has become a hotbed for the newly infected. While in the office, the now infected Dr. Abbas stumbles across her and attacks, and she kills the animal that used to be the doctor. The next morning, Mel finds a supply drop from the GRE, and inside she finds a single remaining syringe of medication labeled Antizin. Not knowing if the medication helps the already infected or not, she decides to try to use it to save her brother instead of herself. She heads to the Newtown High School, referred to by other survivors as a nest of the infected, and there she is able to disguise her own smell with the blood of corpses to enter the building. Inside she finds her infected brother and formulates a plan to give him the medicine. After heading back out into the city to gather supplies, helping a pair of uninfected girls escape from a biker gang from the slums along the way, she returns to the school with freshly crafted Molotov cocktails. She quickly finds Paul and using the cocktails, she is able to create a diversion and get him out of the school. Mel gives Paul the medicine but begins to succumb to the effects of the virus herself. 
When the medicine doesn't cure her brother, she is forced to use her revolver to put him out of his misery, before turning it on herself, using her last bullet, but missing the shot. She is then forced to turn and begins to hunt her new prey as an infected. Two months after the initial outbreak in Haran, the GRE send an undercover agent named Kyle Crane into the quarantine zone to track down a political figure named Kadir Suleiman, who, blaming the GRE for his brother's death, stole a file from them containing highly sensitive information about the structure of the virus, which, if released, could pose a huge threat to mankind. After parachuting into the city, Crane is forced to make a rough landing, allowing him to be ambushed by a group of bandits, led by a man named Tahir. He uses his firearm to fight off the bandits, but the shot draws the attention of a nearby infected, which bites Crane's arm. Luckily, he is rescued by a woman named Jade Aldemir, who is able to get him to safety before he passes out. Crane finally awakens three days later, and finds himself inside an apartment building in the slums known amongst the survivors as The Tower. There he meets Jade's brother Rahim, who tells him about a lost survivor on one of the tower's other floors. Crane decides to look for the survivor to prove himself, and once he's alone, he calls his superiors and fills them in, admitting his infection, which they claim he can temporarily keep at bay if he can find some of the antizin suppressant. Crane finds the lost survivor and helps administer some first aid until the tower's physician, Lena, can arrive to tend to him. Now seeing Crane's worth, Rahim asks the man to meet him again, and when he does so, Crane finds Rahim arguing with his sister about the former's plan to use explosives to destroy a nearby infected nest before she storms off. Rahim takes Crane to the tower's rooftop and teaches him the basics of parkour, a skill he will soon find useful to escape the infected in the city. After the training, however, Crane begins to have a seizure as a result of the virus taking hold inside of him. Rahim then sends Crane to find a Dr. Imran Zara nearby, who can provide him with a shot of antizin, and he then retrieves a weapon and heads out into the city of Haran alone. Crane finds the doctor in his mobile research lab, where he is currently trying to develop a vaccine for the virus. In the meantime, he gives Crane a dose of the antizin to temporarily keep him from turning. After a quick call with Rahim, Crane talks with Sarah's guard, Spike, who tasks him with arming a set of traps to allow the tower's leader, Harris Brecken, to retrieve a GRE supply drop of antizin. Crane arms the traps, contacting the GRE on the way, who inform him to steal all of Zara's research as part of his mission. Crane takes shelter for the night and wakes up to bad news from Spike. Despite their efforts, Brecken's mission failed, and the man was left severely injured. Crane returns to the tower, and Jade informs him that Brecken was ambushed by bandits, who attacked him and stole the airdrop. Crane finally meets Brecken face to face, and he volunteers to retrieve the next airdrop so Brecken can stay behind and heal from his wounds. Brecken reluctantly accepts Crane's help, and he heads out, helping Lena retrieve some medication for Brecken's head trauma before finding the location of the airdrop. Unfortunately, the bandits beat Crane to the first drop, but he's able to get to the second one just before sunset. He calls the GRE, who believe that the bandit's leader, known locally as Rise, is very likely the man they're looking for, so they task him with destroying the antizin to force a meeting between Rise and the tower, which Crane can broker. After burning the antizin, Crane calls Jade and lies, telling her the medication is missing. Night then falls, and Crane is forced to run from the darkness-dwelling, powerful infected variant known as Volatiles to return to the tower. There, Crane interrupts a meeting between Brecken, Jade, and Rahim about buying Antizin from Rise. He offers to meet the man to set up the deal, and Brecken shows him where the bandit leader's location is. At Rice's garrison, Crane is met by Tahir once again, who seems to recognize him but lets it pass. He then briefly meets with Rise, who claims he will take Crane's services and loyalty, and Tahir sends him to meet with Rise's quartermaster, Kareem. Kareem sends Crane to climb and repair some communication towers. On his way, Crane calls the GRE and positively IDs Rise as his target, Suleiman. After repairing the antennas, Crane returns to Rise to retrieve his payment, but the warlord refuses to hand over the antizin, instead offering a double or nothing assignment to go collect payments from nearby settlements. Crane then travels around the city and strong arms these payments from a man named Jafar, another named Gersel, and finally one named Morgan. On his way back to Rice, Crane receives a frantic call from Brecken informing him that someone has fully turned at the tower, creating an outbreak on one of the floors. After rushing back towards the garrison, Crane gets another call, this time from Kareem, who instructs him to investigate a missing patrol that was transporting some documents. After finding the dead patrol and the documents, Crane runs back to the garrison to finally collect his payment. As expected, Rice again alters the deal, 
and instead of paying the promised two crates of Antizen, the warlord only parts with five vials. He then proposes his final condition for the full payment, bringing Jade back to his arena to fight for his amusement. Crane refuses, but Rice tells the man to leave and think about his offer. Outside, Crane calls the GRE who urge him to fulfill Rice's request in order to complete his mission. Crane returns to the tower with the five vials, handing them off to Jade before speaking with Brecken, who snaps over losing the entire floor to the virus and learning that the GRE have stopped the Antizen drops. Crane calms him down and promises to get the Antizen from Rice somehow, before going up to the roof, where he finds a drunken Rahim. Young man tells Crane about his plan to blow up a nearby infected nest inside a skyscraper to make their nighttime running missions easier. The boy then stumbles off the edge of the roof, and Crane quickly grabs him, saving his life and earning his trust and starting a partnership between the two. Crane sneaks off and calls the GRE, asking them to restart the Antizen drops near the tower, but they refuse, instead prodding him to get Jade to Rice's arena. Right after, Crane receives a call from Jade about a nearby school where Rice's men have been loading boxes. Believing this to be where Rice is storing his supply of Antizen, Jade asks Crane to meet her nearby. At the school, Jade and Crane watch to hear kill a trio of survivors before driving off, and the pair sneak inside the school separately. Crane searches for the Antizen, but comes up short. The pair regroup in the basement, where they open a box to find what Rise was hiding. Not Antizen, but instead a cache of plastic explosive. Rise's men then attack, forcing Crane to fight them off as a diversion while Jade escapes the school with the explosives. After the battle, Crane returns to the tower and warns Rahim not to use the explosives and instead allow him to execute the plan to destroy the nest. Crane then meets with Dr. Zara about a rare type of zombies he has seen at night, known as a bolter, and the doctor asks for a sample of their tissue to study. During the night, Crane is able to sneak and kill one of the creatures, taking the sample back to Zara. Zara inspects the tissue and finds that it had been mutated by an altered strain of the virus that the doctor had injected into bait he left around the city. Believing this to mean that they can use this knowledge to alter the strain further to eventually formulate a cure, Zara proposes that Crane delivers the research to a Dr. Camden in the Old Town section of Haran. Crane agrees, and the doctor asks him to come back later to give him time to assemble the package. As he leaves Zara's lab, Crane gets a call from Rahim. The panic man tells him that he had gone to blow up the nest despite his promise, but the plan went awry. The call then cuts off, and Crane rushes off to rescue him. Crane finds Rahim hiding in an abandoned train car and kills the infected surrounding it to find the injured young man inside. Rahim quickly hands Crane the explosives, which he had already armed to explode in mere minutes, and Crane rushes to the nest to plant them. Luckily, he is able to plant the explosives in time, and he escapes just before they detonate, destroying the infected nest in the process. Crane returns to the train car to find a terrible surprise, an infected Rahim, now turned after being bitten during his attempted mission. Crane is regretfully forced to kill Rahim before returning to the tower to break the news to Brecken. During their conversation, they turn to see Jade, who overheard the entire thing, and she promptly runs off. To make matters even worse, the pair then hear an explosion outside, coming from Zara's trailer. Crane goes to investigate and finds the doctor missing with his lab aflame. Knowing that Zara's capture was Rice's payback for stealing the explosives, Brecken sends Crane to the garrison to rescue him. Crane gets to the garrison and breaks inside, calling the GRE for backup. He's surprised to find that the GRE doesn't answer his call, but instead finds the Ministry of Defense on the other end of the line, who tell him that the GRE's mission has been abandoned, and they instead plan to bomb the city to eliminate any trace of the virus. Crane explains that Zara has almost found a cure, and the man on the other end gives Crane a 48-hour deadline to prove it before they drop the bombs. Crane fights through Rice's men in their compound, finding Dr. Zara, who explains that he gave his research to Jade before his capture. Suddenly, the lights cut, and when they turn back on, the pair find Rice with his men, holding them at gunpoint. Tahir grabs the doctor, and Rice reveals that he allowed Crane to reach him to give up the location of his research. Rice then tells his men to search for Jade, before stabbing Zara in the leg and having Crane taken to his arena, aptly named The Pit. One of Rice's men then bludgeons Crane with the butt of his rifle, knocking him out. When Crane comes to, he finds himself inside the pit, while Dr. Zara is being held hostage above. Rice hints that he knows about Crane's lies before leaving him weaponless to fight a horde of infected. Crane survives the arena, and Rice simply states that the GRE selects its operatives well, 
revealing that the warlord had known the undercover operative's true nature all along. He then gives the order to his men to release the file he had been holding as leverage to the public. Crane chastises Rice for releasing information that can end up harming masses of people, but Rice shrugs this off, telling him that the GRE never intended to use the data to make a cure, but they instead planned to weaponize the virus to sell for profit. Rice then orders his men to kill Crane, but he is able to very quickly outmaneuver them, grabbing a nearby machete and using it to kill Rice's guards before slicing off the warlord's hand retrieving his gun from the ground, and shooting the guard holding Zara hostage. Crane rushes to the moving platform lifting Zara from the pit, and finds the doctor with a knife in his chest. Zara leaves the man with one final plea to save the people of Haran, before dying from his wound. Just then, Rice cauterizes his wound with a torch, and orders his remaining men to shoot Crane. Crane runs to escape, but as he clears the compound, he again begins to feel the effects of the virus taking hold, and he passes out. Crane awakens later to find that Brecken had rescued him and hid him from Rice's men. The pair discuss Jade, who tried to take Zara's research to Dr. Camden in Old Town, but when Rice attacked the doctor's lab, he allowed a flood of infected inside and barricaded himself in the middle. Crane then enlists the help of a group called the Saviors, who help him get into Old Town. After fighting through another ambush from Rice's men, Crane emerges in the quarantined Old Town, where he meets with a woman named Troy who puts him in contact with Jade. Crane finally reveals to Jade that he had been hired by the GRE, but stresses the importance of getting the information to the Ministry of Defense before they bomb the city. Angered at the betrayal, Jade cuts the communication line, but Troy reveals that the last time Jade was seen, she was at the nearby university. Crane goes to the university and asks the survivors settled there about her whereabouts, but learns nothing. Crane then calls Troy, and she tells him to come back to her location to see something they've discovered. Troy's group, the Embers, had broken through the signal blocking in the area, and they watch a news broadcast about the GRE's implication in the virus outbreak, as well as news of an announcement of Haran's president claiming that the city was now only inhabited by infected, giving them an excuse to destroy the city with no backlash. Crane helps the Embers detonate a series of explosives, in a pattern to send a message to anybody observing the city that conscious humans are still in the area. After detonating the explosives, the Ministry flies a plane through the building, destroying the message and making the plan for naught. Crane's actions end up serving a purpose after all, as they prove to Jade that he does intend to help the survivors in Haran. The pair agree to meet in person, but when Crane arrives at the meetup spot, he only finds a message left by Rice, written in blood, beckoning him to come to the museum. Crane learns that Rice has been using this museum as a stronghold, and he finds the building's custodian who tells him about a secret entrance to the building through a series of underwater tunnels. Crane swims through and enters the museum where he is confronted by Rice, who shows Crane images of a captive Jade. Rice then six his men on Crane, who fights them off while traversing the museum, eventually finding the room where Jade is being held. Inside, Rice once again speaks with Crane, this time revealing that when Crane fixed his antennas, it allowed him to listen into all of their communication. Knowing that with Zara's research he now holds the true bargaining chip with the GRE, he releases a wave of infected into the room to kill the pair. They are able to fight them off, but as they go to escape, Jade collapses. Rice then reveals that Jade had been bitten hours prior. Rice then throws Crane a vial of antizin, instructing him to choose between giving it to the woman to prevent her imminent turning, or taking it himself to prevent his own. Jade takes the vial and asks Crane to promise that he will be the one to kill her when the time comes. He then begins to have another seizure, and hallucinates following Jade through a dreamscape, where he eventually finds her as an infected, attempting to kill him. He is soon snapped out of the dream to find Jade injecting the antizin into him while he holds her neck, and he lets her go. Rice sends his men in, and Jade swiftly takes them down, before biting into the last one's flesh, fully turning. After Rice walks away, Jade lunges at Crane, and he is forced to snap her neck, fulfilling his promise. Tahir then attacks Crane himself, but Crane is able to defeat the man in battle, recovering Jade's bag, finding tissue samples inside, but not the other research. He then executes Tahir before leaving the museum. Before taking the samples to Camden, Crane and the Embers decide to broadcast a message to the world using a signal booster atop a giant antenna to try to stop the bombing which is due to happen within hours. After fighting through an army of infected, Crane is able to climb the tower and transmit the message, broadcasting to the entire world that there are still survivors in the area, forcing the bomber planes to abort their mission and fly away. 
Crane then receives a call from the GRE offering him a safe escape from the city in a helicopter in exchange for Zara's research, but he refuses, knowing they'll only use the cure to further cover up their corruption. Crane returns to Old Town and makes his way to Camden's lab. There, he travels through the facility while Camden reminisces about the events that led to him winding up there in the first place, and Crane pieces together that he wasn't the only GRE operative sent into the quarantine zone. When Crane finally reaches Camden, he gives the doctor the tissue samples before leaving to find Zara's missing research. Beforehand, however, he decides to call the GRE. When he calls them, however, he is shocked to hear an unexpected voice on the other end, none other than Rice reveals that he took the deal to hand over Zara's research to the GRE in order to secure his own exit from the city so he can continue to wreak havoc outside its walls. He then prompts Crane to come find him in order to stop him. Crane then fights through the infected, as well as the effects of his own infection, on his way back to Rice's headquarters in the slums, eventually climbing the tower there to find the warlord waiting for him at the top. Rice throws the package of research to Crane, who catches it, but is soon met by the next thing Rice throws, a knife which lands in his chest. Crane drops the research, and Rice begins to swing a blade wildly. Crane is able to outmaneuver the man and stab him with his own blade, leaving him incapacitated to die from his wounds. As he goes to grab the research, the GRE helicopter arrives, and the distraction allows Rice to get up and push Crane over the edge of the tower. While hanging on by one hand, Crane is able to throw the research back on the roof before pulling the knife from his chest and plunging it into Rice's neck, finally killing the man as he falls off the tower. Crane then climbs back up to the top of the roof and secures the research. The GRE then call him and ask him to hand it over, but he refuses, stating that as long as the cure exists inside the city's walls, they can't bomb it. The helicopter flies off, and Crane gets a call from Camden, who states that between the tissue samples and the research, a cure will definitely be possible. Crane then heads off to deliver the package to him, now with a new sense of optimism and determination. While Camden works on the cure, Crane is contacted by Lena about a man who spoke to her about people immune to the virus, as well as domesticated infected and some kind of magic. Lena gives Crane a map the man was holding, which shows a way out of Haran. The man suddenly awakens and grabs Crane, telling him to stay away and warning of the mother. Crane follows the map and finds himself outside the city walls, emerging into the countryside surrounding Haran. Crane finds a settlement, and there he meets one of the elders, Jasir, as well as his daughter, Ezgi. Jasir refuses to answer any of Crane's questions, but another man named Khan, an outsider to the group, explains that the locals are part of some kind of cult, called the Children of the Sun, that follows a woman called the Mother. Before answering more of Crane's questions, Khan proposes a partnership between the two sending him off to retrieve a buggy from a nearby group of bandits. When Crane returns to the settlement, however, he finds Khan gone, with Ezgi in his stead, stating that the group has finally asked the man to leave. Ezgi surmises that in order for her group to cooperate with Crane, he'll have to prove himself by helping them out with various tasks and errands. Crane then drives around the countryside in his newly acquired buggy, meeting and helping the various survivors of the land. Through his travels, Crane learns more about the Children of the Sun, the Mother, and her priests, known as the Faceless. After proving his intentions are pure, Crane is invited to a lake called the Eye of the Sun to be blessed by the Mother. There, Crane finds a ritual in progress led by the Mother, where he is surprised to see Khan, seemingly completely indoctrinated by the group. The Faceless then walk through the crowd holding sensors, emitting a blue gas. When Crane inhales the gas, he begins to hear the mother speaking with him telepathically, and he soon finds that nearby infected are no longer hostile to him. He soon collapses, and when he awakens, he finds the crowd dispelled and the mother now gone. At this point, Jasir gives Crane a key card left behind by a former military officer. Using this key, Crane can stumble upon nuclear launch codes, as well as the key to a military transport vehicle. Inside the vehicle, Crane can find a nuclear warhead, and if he decides to, he can use the launch codes to detonate the bomb and bring the virus, as well as all of Haran, to a fiery end. Otherwise, Crane continues to help the Children of the Sun, also referred to as the Following, eventually finding a field covered in the blue gas. Crane inspects the field and finds the remnants of a military transport vehicle, including empty crates. The Faceless reveal that the Mother found this elixir that works as a temporary solution to the virus. They are working on a project with 
more permanence and asks Crane to find more of the elixir to buy them time. Crane investigates the cave where the following originally found the elixir, finding another destroyed military vehicle, as well as dead members of both the following, as well as remnants of Rice's gang, much to Crane's surprise. In order to find the stolen elixir, Crane tracks down the bandits to a granary, which they are currently using as their makeshift base. There, Crane finds a kidnapped faceless named Brother Orkin, tortured to near death. Orkin reveals that the bandits followed them to steal the cure, but they didn't know how to open it, so they went after the mother. In his dying breath, he tells Crane to go to the lighthouse. At the lighthouse, Crane is attacked by the bandits' leader, who he is surprised to find is none other than Khan. Crane forces Khan to reveal his men's next move, and he points to the dam, where they intend to enter the mother's den and kill her. In an attempt to kill Crane, the bandits shoot missiles at the lighthouse, bringing it down. While Khan dies in the fall, Crane survives without a scratch, and grabs what remains of the stolen vials before racing to the dam. When Crane enters, however, he finds a slew of faceless murdered, as well as a trail of slaughtered bandits. As Crane looks for the mother, she telepathically tells him her story. When the outbreak occurred, the mother and her husband were bitten, and before the man died in her arms, he gave her a cigarette case containing a map, a key, and a list of numbers. This led the mother and her group to the dam, where she found a locked container which the numbers opened to reveal the vials. With no other choice, the mother ingested the serum inside. She then passed out, and when she awoke, she found that she had turned into a sentient volatile. In the light, she maintains control over her own mind, but in the dark, the virus takes hold and she becomes one of the feral creatures. She then learned that when the gas is vaporized, its effects are weakened, and she was able to use that knowledge to gain her following and take care of her people. Crane tries to ask for the vials to save his friends at the tower, but she refuses to give it to him, knowing that whatever serum is inside is no cure, but instead a different curse. She then gives him a final choice, to activate a warhead the military hid inside the dam as a failsafe to completely eradicate the virus. If Crane chooses to help the mother, she leads him to the warhead and he realizes that her husband had left the launch codes with a man named Attila, who Crane had previously helped before the man left him the codes in his death. Crane then inputs the launch codes, and the mother thanks him just before it detonates, fulfilling her perceived purpose and destroying the virus, sacrificing the thousands of nearby lives along with them. In the more likely ending, Crane refuses to activate the nuke, instead trying to force the mother to hand over the vials. Knowing he wants the serum so badly, she then opens one of the containers and pours it into his mouth, forcing him to drink it. Feeling anger over his refusal to help her save humanity, the mother then attacks the man and a battle ensues. While her abilities as a sentient volatile prove to be a challenge, Crane's own transformation due to his ingesting the serum begins to close the gap in their abilities. Crane is able to defeat the mother in combat and she pleads with him one final time not to take the serum, as it will poison all of mankind and doom it to their same fate. Crane instead crushes her skull, killing her before grabbing the remaining vials. Crane tries to call Lena to tell her about his new, better lead, but as he emerges from the dam, he finds himself outside of the quarantine zone. There, a family spots him, and they are immediately struck with terror. He then looks down at his own arms, seeing his new form as a sentient volatile. The sun then sets, and as the night falls, only the sound of a volatile scream is heard in the darkness. Ten years later, in the European city of Villador, we find a doctor attempting to create a vaccine for the now-named Haran-19 virus. While the vaccine is estimated to be about 83% effective, it does carry some side effects. Despite this, Army General Buren shuts down all vaccine development, stating that they plan on taking things in another direction while embracing any side effects. He then orders his men to kill all of the remaining primate test subjects while firing the doctor, who is only allowed to take personal items with her, and she grabs a necklace with a black locket. As she leaves, an announcement is broadcast throughout the city, and the military begins to deploy the unfinished vaccine gas into the air. While the doctor tries to warn her fellow citizens, she is forced to run to her car, where she uses her dress to cover the vents as she drives out of the city. Once outside the poisoned air, she calls an ex-girlfriend, asking for a place to stay. 
Meanwhile, General Buren reveals his plan in his office to Professor Collins, the doctor originally leading the development. Believing that the virus would eventually destroy the city, Buren's intention is to use the incomplete vaccine to cull the herd and allow the fittest to survive, essentially speeding up the inevitable. While he asks for Collins' help with the public relations of his plan, the professor declines, and he suddenly dies on his way out as he breathes in the gas. Later, the doctor and her ex discuss the day's events, and the doctor reveals the locket contained a hidden memory card of her research. She then sees a text message from Professor Collins, who attached his own report from a test of the unfinished vaccine, showing the progression of the Haran virus from initial infection to final turning point. The doctor then decides to find a way to save the city before more of the gas is released into the air. Inside the military base, Buren looks at the results of the deployment and finds the side effects to be far worse than even he imagined. With Collins now dead, he sends his men to find the doctor before they spray the second dose. Unfortunately, during transport, one of the canisters springs a leak. Back in the ex's apartment, the doctor informs her that she was able to use the research from the professor to create an antidote for the gas. The two then hear an announcement about a party at City Hall to commemorate General Buren, and they decide to crash it. As they arrive at City Hall, the side effects of the gas continue to grow and grow, with the military now visibly taking action to stop the infected. Inside the party, the doctor finds Buren, telling her ex to remember the formula for the antidote currently resides inside her locket. The doctor confronts Buren, and she chastises him for infecting half of the city. He is quick to correct her, however, stating that it is no longer half the city, as the second dose is currently being deployed. He offers her a deal to give him the antidote for 4% of what he would make selling it, but she refuses, causing him to don a mask and open a canister of the gas, instantly infecting the doctor. The ex then shoots at the general with a gun she wrestled away from his guard, and he runs off, leaving the two women on the balcony. Not wanting to turn, the doctor simply hands her locket to the ex, then jumps from the building, falling tens of stories to the gas-filled streets below. The general then escapes in a helicopter, taking some of his wealthy benefactors with him, but leaving most behind. The ex then stands with the cure around her neck, knowing she is now the only hope for the city to fight its real disease, as the gas begins to rise and envelop her as well. Outside in the city, an extremely agile infected leaps across several buildings, before scaling the side of one and emerging at the top. We then see what remains of the doctor's ex, standing before the city of Villador as the Banshee, a powerful monster with the cure to her own disease, as well as the entire city's around her neck. And with that, we reach the end of the story thus far, where we'll pick up 10 years later with a man named Aiden Caldwell, when he arrives in the city looking for his missing sister. As we all know, however, the city holds more secrets than even he could imagine. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching this video. Please leave a like if it helped you out, and make sure to subscribe for all my new videos. And ring that bell if you want to make sure you catch the streams where I play through the games I cover. You can also follow me on Twitter for updates, at Suggestive Games, and you can come chat with myself and the community by joining our Discord server by clicking the link in the description. As mentioned in the intro, if you'd like another way to show your thanks, you can support by becoming a channel member here on YouTube, or by heading over to Patreon. Both those links are in the description below. And I want to take the time to thank those folks who are helping me out every month, whose names are on screen now. Thanks again, guys. Bye.